Thanks, Jaden. It's great to be here. These are my kids. <coughs> On the right, uh, that's Amelia. She's age seven. On the left is Nellie. She's three. Um, this picture was taken last summer. We were watching the Olympics on television, um, women's gymnastics, and uh, the kids disappeared after a while, came back a couple of minutes later, and they had toilet paper wrapped around their hands, and they started uh, jumping around the house doing kind of crazy things, um, probably dangerous things, but uh, anyway, they were inspired by uh, the gymnasts. Um, I love being a dad. Um, it's, uh, it's an awesome experience. It's, it's, uh, it's scary. It's exciting. It's intimidating. Mostly, it's it's joyful. Um, and one of the things that I love about being a dad is that uh, my kids ask me uh, to help them understand the world around them. They ask me lots of questions. And they ask what things mean. You know, it, it happens a lot, actually. Both kids will say, Daddy, what does that word mean? And, uh, and so, you know, as a parent, it's our responsibility to help them understand, you know, what the world means. And you explain it to them. And, and I find sometimes I'll think, oh, did I get that right? And I'll scurry off and, you know, Google it or check on the dictionary to make sure that, you know, the, the, the definition I gave, the explanation I gave was right. Because, you know, they're young and you, you want to explain something in a way that's accessible, but it also has to be correct. It has to be true. Um, lately, I've been thinking about uh, innovation. And uh, I'm involved in, in that kind of world, uh, in the creative world, and innovation is a word um, that comes up a lot. I've noticed it a lot lately. You know, it's, I would say it's, it's almost a trendy word. Um, there are chief innovation officers, and I don't remember that being a term that was used like five years ago. Um, it's also a word that I think uh, people have different ideas about what it means. Um, it's kind of a little bit connected to the idea of invention, um, and yet they're different. Uh, but how? Uh, just take a moment, think about that. What's the difference between invention and innovation? It's also a word that, um, uh, when I looked it up in the dictionary, because I did, uh, <laughs> it had a kind of a disappointing uh, definition. It, it, it's new. It's something that's new, you know, a new product or a new way of, of, of doing things. And, and I, that's obviously true, um, and yet I think it's a bit broader than that. So I want to talk about uh, invention and innovation. Um, and, and talk a little bit about innovation. I'm going to start with, uh, with this thing here. This, I've been holding, uh, clinging to it, <laughs> um, is uh, a paper clip. And um, I've been clinging to it, by the way, because I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, so the paper clip, I, I have a degree in industrial design. I studied industrial design. And, and uh, when I was studying, this object became, for me, kind of a perfect object. It, you know, I, I really did hope that in my lifetime I could create something as, as kind of uh, simple and useful and functional and beautiful as a paperclip. Um, it's an invention. It's been around for about 100 years. It was uh, invented, um, well actually a few people took credit for it, but the machine for making it was uh, patented in I think uh, 1799. Um, and it's essentially been unchanged in that entire time. It's incredibly useful, um, but that, that is what I would call an invention. So here's, here's an innovation. I'm bending out the end of the wire there. So this now is no longer a paper clip. This is a floppy disk ejector, or it's a, a, <laughs> it's a SIM card ejector, or, um, you know, it has lots of, of uses, actually. I mean, anything where you need a pointy object and a convenient little handle to, to do something with. But it's not a paper clip. And I think this is kind of the essence of innovation for me. Um, you can look on the internet and see other examples. Uh, this is not a pop bottle. It's a sprinkler. That's not an iron. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pepperoni grill, I guess. And this, this is not a shopping cart. <laughs> that's, that's a barbecue. And the thing about, uh, the thing about innovation is it's always driven by a need. It's always driven by a need. I need to cook up these, uh, these burgers. I don't have a... Gr oh, there's a shopping cart. Um, and there's this great saying, necessity is the mother of invention. I love this saying. I love this saying. For me, um, I think this is the absolutely 
the essence of, of innovation. I think it's actually connected not only to invention, as the saying says, uh, innovation, also creativity. We're creative when we need to be creative, when there's a need. I think actually kids are naturally uh, inventive and innovative. Um, they don't call it innovation, they call it let's pretend. So this is Nellie, who uh, we were at a restaurant uh, with recently. A family went to a restaurant and uh, she needed to make a phone call. And uh, I wouldn't give her my phone, so she used a banana. And she happily uh, talked away and, you know, pushed buttons on the banana. Amelia uh, doesn't have long hair. She has kind of sort of mid-length hair. But um, she really wants long hair. So she, for a while there, she, weeks, she would tie these scarves around her hair and she would, or, or at the back, and she would pretend that these scars were her hair. She was innovating. She was pretending. It all kind of goes back to imagination. Um, there's a need, and, uh, and you begin to imagine a solution. You start playing with ideas. Even, even the paper clip, you know, if I, if I uh, just bend it out to make it a wire. I mean, this is one of the things I love about a paper clip. It's a, it's a wire bent three times, and it does this amazing thing. But it started out as just a wire, and someone needed to hold some papers together, and it's like, wow, you know, if only I had a little thing that was, you know, well, hey, I got some wire, and I'll bend it. And bingo, uh, you know, you've got a paper clip. Um, and that's kind of the pattern, actually. It starts with imagination, and then it moves to uh, inspiration, and then innovation, and then either it's going to end up on the Internet um, with a funny picture, or maybe it'll, it, it'll evolve and become an invention, a useful little invention like, like a paper clip um, that has a, a unique function. So how important is imagination? Well, uh, a few years ago, about six years ago, I was uh, um, working on a documentary called Nuclear 9-11. And as the name suggests, um, it was a documentary about the possibility of a nuclear attack in a major U.S. city, not unlike 9-11. I was in New York, and I was interviewing this guy uh, named Graham Allison, and he is uh, the um, uh, director of uh, government at the GFK School at Harvard. And we were just talking. I was gathering uh, an interview for the documentary. And he, he cited this report. And he said that uh, of all of the findings of the 9-11 of the Commission, the principal finding, the key finding in the whole report was that it was a failure of imagination. And you know, when he said this, it, it hit me. It's like, wow, I did not see that coming. I, I would have thought that it was... You know, it was like, you know, security breaches and intelligence failures and, you know, blah, blah, blah. A failure of imagination. It really struck me. It really struck me. You know, Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge. I remember the first time I saw uh, this, this, uh, this uh, saying or this, this uh, uh, quote. I was working at the Science Center here in Regina, and in the store they had a poster up, and it was that sort of famous picture of Einstein with his crazy hair and so on and you know it had imagination is more important than knowledge and I remember thinking oh, that's kind of cute that's that's cute that the big brain uh, Einstein mathematician scientist would say that you know um, and I see it from time to time now you know Facebook postings you know you'll see it but I think you know if Einstein were here he, he would say no no really it's more important you know we've got some big problems in the world and and uh, and I think we need imagination and we need innovation to be able to solve them and so as a father of little kids I'm trying to figure out how what I'm supposed to do how, how am I supposed to help them to uh, to be imaginative and, and to be innovative recently um, my daughter uh, Amelia who's in the in the red or sorry the pink hoodie there um, started soccer and uh, it was the first soccer practice and uh, at the end of the soccer practice the coach, who is the tech technical director of, of, the, um, of the club, a guy named Hugh Dooley, um, brought all the parents together and he said, okay, I just wanted to explain about what just happened, you know, with the practice. And we had 15 minutes of, of this and 15 minutes of this and you know, we ended with 15 minutes of three on three. And the first 15 minutes, he said, was to, for the kids to do this. Uh, right now they're, they're running and they're running backwards. They're running up and they're running backwards. And he, he said, we're, we're practicing physical literacy. And, you know, he said this with a kind of a disdain. It was kind of funny because 
he said, yeah, we, you have to do this 15 minutes of physical literacy. And he said, you know, 20 years ago, we didn't have to do this stuff. Kids were climbing trees and falling out of trees and playing around, and, and they understood their bodies and, and so on. We didn't have to teach them how to run backwards. And this was another thing that sort of struck me. It's like, yeah, you know, he's right. You know, 20, 30 years ago, that was uh, a play structure. It's a kind of this, a tree. It's organic, and kids will interact with it in lots of different ways, in whatever way that suits them, and they'll experience it, and uh, they'll, they'll learn about their body and so on. But now, of course, uh, we have the play structures that you see in parks, colorful, uh, you know, metal you know, fairly kind of rigid things. And they're designed mostly to protect kids, you know, to keep them safe, not, you know, so that they can have some activity but not hurt themselves. And that's important. But there's something about that that I think is, is, um, is kind of too bad because it, what it does is it kind of processes the play experience. It removes the sort of the po possibility of an open-ended outcome. Um, I want to show you another process play experience. Yeah. This is Barbie's camper. This is um, a toy that our girls have had uh, for a couple of years now, and they play with it. I just want to give you a quick tour. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there's a doorway here, and uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's a flat screen TV in there, so in case you want to watch TV while you're out camping, that's, that's there. Um, there's a, a, you know, a little access for your pet, which is, which is great. Um, at the back here, this is really cool. Uh, either interior or exterior, there's a shower, you know, and a toilet. <laughs> uh, but wait, there's more. Um, in case it's a sunny day, pretty cool. That this is a this is a pretty cool toy. And I know what you're thinking. I I know you're just sort of thinking, well, that's pretty cool, Stephen, but. You know, imagine if it, if it had a hot tub. That would be cooler, right? Well, <laughs> there's a hot tub. <laughs> this is a cool toy. My, my girls have had it for a couple of years. They play with it. It's fun. But I have to say that there's a part of me that when I see this toy, I have to wonder, what's left for them to imagine? What's left? <laughs> You know, um, a couple of weeks ago, Chris Hadfield came back from out of space and spent five months, you know, we're pretty proud of him as Canadians, a uh, Canadian astronaut, spent five months in space. And, you know, that first image when he came down after he'd been doing all that cool stuff in space was him being carried because he couldn't, he couldn't lift his arms, he couldn't walk, he, couldn't, he could barely move because he hadn't used those muscles. He hadn't used those muscles in five months. They became flabby and, and, and he just wasn't using them. And so it, it's, it's sort of made me think, it's like, what are we doing to exercise our kids' imaginations, imagination muscles when the play experiences we have for them, the, the play experiences that they experience, have kind of a pre-processed quality to them? You know, remember, necessity is the mother of invention. If there's no need for them to use that muscle to solve those problems, um, well, they won't, right? Um, th we need to have a need for them to be able to, to do that. Um, any parent of a young child, particularly if that child's name is Amelia and she's seven, has heard this. Because Amelia lately has come to me and said, Daddy, I'm bored, although she says it's something like this, I'm bored. <laughs> and, you know, my initial response to this was uh, to do two things, both of which, or I should say neither of which, are particularly helpful in, in encouraging her to be uh, creative and, and, and maybe even innovative. Um, firstly, I solve that problem for her. So I'll, I'll give her something to do, right? So I've removed the need for her to actually do anything, to think about what to do, to imagine a solution to her need problem, which is to find something to do. I give it to her. So she doesn't have to use that muscle. And then the second thing I do, equally unhelpful, I think, in terms of developing her ability um, to be, to be uh, creative, is I'll give her a, a process play experience. I'll say, well, go and play with your Barbie camper, or go and, you know, color in, or make, you know, play with a puzzle, or watch TV, you know. None of these things will exercise that muscle. And I just think that we need to, we need to consider, uh, 
the effect of that. Now, my wife, who's in the audience, uh, and I have lately, you know, we talked a lot about this. And one of the things that we, we have come to is that we don't want to deny them the Barbie campers. You know, they have fun with this, and that's great. We don't want to deny that. But we do want to uh, introduce uh, what we're considering to be raw, uh, raw elements, you know, in, into their play experience. So just blank pieces of paper and just really ordinary, fundamental, basic things. Because we've kind of come to the conclusion that, that uh, play is a little bit like food, you know. The less processed it is, the more nutritional value it has. And we're, we're not going to deny them the Barbie camper. We're not going to deny them even TV and so on. But we are trying to kind of mix it up. We're trying to give them kind of a more balanced play diet, if you will. Um, now, this is something that uh, uh, years ago there was a, a kindergarten teacher who basically did this um, with her kindergarten kids, and she gave them uh, toothpicks and, and peas and said, here, kids, knock yourself out. Here's some toothpicks and peas, some really raw material, some basic, basic things. And these kids started kind of playing with them. Some kids, you know, put together and made little people and so on. Other kids you know, made houses and stuff like that. There was one kid who was fascinated by uh, triangles, and, and, and he discovered that there's an inherent strength in, you know, when you, when you have the peas as nodes and you build these kind of three-dimensional triangles, there's an inherent strength in that. That kid was Buckminster Fuller, and he went on to, uh, to create and invent the geodesic dome. And he, he acknowledges the influence of that early experience that he had. Um, so if my talk here is about inspiring kids to be creative as a parent, we're, we're wanting to give our kids as much as we possibly can to uh, improve their lives, to give them the best possible chance to succeed going forward, to make a difference in the world. And, you know, the thing that, that's really a little bit ironic here is that um, you have to do something that kind of cuts against the grain a little bit. And, uh, you know, my wife and I have, have decided that, that actually the best way we can help them is to give them less, to not solve their boredom problems for them, you know, when Amelia comes to me now and says, Daddy, I'm bored, I say, tell me what you're going to do about that. I just want to end real quick with uh, this. Uh, it's a text that my wife sent me recently, um, last week actually. And uh, she said, this is what Nellie made when I told her to find something to do for a little while. It's a girl. See gold facial features. She's quite proud of herself. <laughs> and I, I looked at this and it's like, what the... And I asked her, I got home, and I said, Nellie, what is that? Like, what did you do? And she said, I, I'm, it's a doll, Daddy. I made, I made it. And she was holding it. And I said, does that doll have a name? And she said, yes, her name is Rosie. And she held her very tightly and uh, gently. And, you know, I don't really see much of a doll there. <laughs> but it doesn't matter because what really counts is what's going on in Nellie's mind, in her imagination. Thank you very much.